Hey guys, I am over the moon to have this episode sponsored by Podcorn. I've had so many listeners contact me since I started True Crime South Africa, telling me that they also want to get into podcasting. And I know that a lot of people listening right now are either considering starting their own podcast or already have. Podcorn is a podcaster's best friend. What I love most about this platform is that they do things completely differently to everyone else. Podcorn is an online marketplace that connects podcasters with sponsorship opportunities like host-read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. What I really respect about Podcorn as a company is that they don't discriminate. So for most platforms like this, you have to be a huge podcast with millions of downloads, but Podcorn gives everyone a chance. You log into the Podcorn marketplace and you choose which brands you want to partner with, set your own rates and design your own adverts. You also deal directly with the brands so there's no miscommunication. I'll leave a link to the Podcorn website in my show notes. Thank you so much to Podcorn for believing in True Crime South Africa and sponsoring this episode. True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to our Spotlight Minisode, which focuses on cases in the media at the moment. Before we get into today's minisode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon subscriber, DT Systems. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. I'd also like to give a shout out to Michelle Whitehead for her donation to the show's running costs. Thank you, Michelle. Donations received through Patreon or through our method of once-off donation, PayPal, are used to increase our research capabilities by paying for access to databases and to purchase equipment. I recently let our Patreon subscribers know that I'm currently researching our first ever Patreon exclusive episode and I asked what sort of add-ons the Patreons would like to see in exchange for their donations. An overwhelming number of you said merchandise and I can confirm that True Crime South Africa branded merchandise is in the pipeline, and it's not too far off from release. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links to both in our show notes. I also recently announced that we just hit 150,000 downloads. For those of you who are new to podcasting, the success and popularity of a podcast is measured predominantly by how many episode downloads it receives on the podcast apps. This number is used to rank the podcast in charts and encourages podcast apps like Spotify and Apple to suggest the podcast to new listeners. Download numbers are also used to encourage companies to purchase advertising on the podcast like the Podcorn sponsorship you heard earlier. Thanks to your amazing support and the phenomenal number of downloads the show has been receiving, CCSA has also managed to secure some new advertising partners. If you listen to other podcasts, you'll know that advertising on podcasts is not uncommon. Revenue from ads helps to pay for the running costs of shows, which include paying for hosting platforms, websites, and a few other things. As TCSA enters this new era, I do commit to you that I will never partner with a company that I don't think can add value to our listeners. All potential sponsors will be carefully screened to ensure that they can offer you a valuable service. I do want to thank you, the True Crime South Africa listeners, no matter what country you're in, for helping me to make the show a success. Yes, I put a lot of hard work into the show, 
but I do it because I believe in what we're doing. And from the number of downloads we've received, apparently you do too. To say that I'm grateful for your support is a huge understatement. I am eternally indebted to each and every one of you who saw the potential in TCSA and became a champion for the cause. And now, before I get too mushy, let's get into today's mini-sode. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. We have had several horrific cases of child murder in the news recently, and far too many of them have been committed by people out on parole for violent offences. As I went through the list of cases we have covered on this podcast so far, Many of them were committed by offenders who were out on parole for previous violent offences. And I even said on our Facebook page recently that I'm starting to feel like our biggest problem with violent crime in this country is not a societal breakdown or ineffective policing. It may just be what happens after these guys get arrested. Our court system, our correctional system and our parole system. The very phrase correctional system tells you what it's supposed to be doing. The point of putting an offender in jail is supposed to be to rehabilitate them. But in at least 70% of cases, that is not happening. South Africa has a reoffense rate of between 70 and 80%. That means for every 10 prisoners that are released, 7 or 8 of them will go on to commit another crime. And those are just the ones we know about. To be fair, this is not a strange statistic. Many countries across the world have similar, if not worse, reoffending rates. It is extremely difficult to rehabilitate people who've been involved in drugs and gang crimes, for instance, because the very nature of the prison environment is that those things just continue while they're inside. We're all shocked when we see proof of prisoners doing drugs in jail, but it's extremely prevalent. And again, that is not unique to South Africa. Where this gets really dangerous, though, is when we talk about violent offenders, people who've been convicted of rape and murder and are committing similar offenses while they're out on bail awaiting trial or on parole, after having been sentenced. One of South Africa's biggest problems is prison overcrowding. As at the end of 2018, we had 165,000 inmates in prisons in South Africa. That number includes awaiting trial prisoners. We have 236 operational prisons in South Africa, and they offer... 120,000 bed spaces in total. So, as at 2018, our prisons were overcrowded by an additional 45,000 inmates. The reasons behind this overcrowding are numerous, but one of the biggest problems is how long it takes for the court system to process offenders. People arrested for non-violent offences who can't afford bail are waiting up to two years for their cases to be heard. It is this overcrowding, I believe, that is playing a huge role in the reoffending rate. If you can't even offer a prisoner a bed, can you really offer them rehabilitation services? The next question is, are the types of violent offenders we're talking about even capable of complete rehabilitation? In one of our last minisodes, we discussed the case of Tasne van Veik, who was kidnapped from her home in early February. At the time, I ended the episode by saying that I hoped she would be returned safely. Sadly, as we now know, that was not the case, and Tasne's body was found in mid-February in a stormwater drain just outside Vista. 
The man who was accused of her kidnapping and murder, who allegedly showed police where her body was, is Moidien Pangaka. Pangaka is a career criminal who's been arrested and imprisoned on at least 12 occasions. Many of these offences were violent, including an assault in 1988 and a culpable homicide conviction in 2001, in which he abducted his two-year-old son, for which he did not have custody, and proceeded to neglect and abuse him so badly that the child died in his care. In an appeal document, the judge looking at the appeal for that case classed the culpable homicide conviction as generous, considering the circumstances. Pankaka was only given 10 years in jail for that offence, and he was out in three years. The reason he was given mitigation of sentence for that crime was because he was using drugs when he killed his son. I'll definitely be doing a much deeper dive into this man's crimes at a later stage. But for the purposes of this minisode, the police did their job here. They did it 12 times. They built cases against him, and he was convicted. What killed Tazne was our court system and our parole system. I cannot fathom how you can release a man with Pangakar's history three years after he essentially beat his own child to death. Tasne's parents have announced that they will be suing the state for having released Pangakar, and I am 100% behind them on that. Maybe, just maybe, this is the wake-up call that the justice system needs to correct its parole regulations. Let me be clear here. There are no victimless crimes, but there are certainly offenders whose release would not necessarily make me lose sleep at night. I am aware of a case where a man has been imprisoned in South Africa for the last 12 years for tax evasion. Whether his sentence fit the crime is not for me to say, but I can say that when you release a man who bludgeoned a two-year-old child to death after three years, and keep a guy who essentially committed a crime against the state in jail for four times that. Something is very broken in the system. Another case of a parolee murdering a child was the murder of eight-year-old Regan Gatza, whose body was found in the bushes of a river bank in Tilbach in early March. The parallels in this case against Tasnes are actually quite frightening. Both victims were eight years old. The suspect in this case is Jacobus Pastuus, who at 54 is the same age as Pangaka. He was released on parole four months ago. Pastuus has been living with Regan's stepfather, two dwellings away from where Regan lived. Pangaka also lived two houses away from Tasne. Pastuus had been sentenced to 12 years in prison for raping a five-year-old boy. Seven years into his sentence, his family members were approached by correctional services about the possibility of offering him a place to stay as he was sickly. They agreed, and he was released on parole. Now I have two problems with this. Firstly, I would assume that this man should be on the sexual offenders role, which in turn means that he should not be allowed to carry out any form of parole or house arrest in a home where he has access to children. The community he moved into was full of children. The second problem I have with this is the community allowing this man in their midst. They knew what he had done in the past. I'm not going to victim blame here because this family will live with this mistake for the rest of their life. But Regan did not have to pay the price. We need to be more vigilant about who we allow around our children. Just last week, another incident broke in the news where a man had been convicted of molesting children 
and was found to be working at a school in Claremont, offering children private art classes. Another case was a pastor in Kempton Park, who was arrested for the possession of child abuse material. In his position as a pastor, there is no doubt he had access to children. In South Africa, we have a sexual offenders register. But unlike some other countries, we as the public do not have access to it. A move is being made for this register to be made available to, at the very least, schools and other places that have large numbers of children. In the art teacher example, I will say that the child protection unit was actually the one who alerted the school that the man working with them was a sex offender. So they are clearly tracking him, and they did what needed to be done. My concern is that the CPU can't possibly track all sex offenders. This doesn't just relate to children. Uyuneni Mwichana's murderer was also a convicted criminal, and the post office allowed him to work in the place that he would eventually end up taking her life in. Her parents are also planning on suing the post office for failure to protect the public. Jessie Hess, who was raped and murdered along with her elderly grandfather, also fell victim to a man with a significant record for various violent crimes. Megan Kramer's alleged murderers also had a history of criminal conduct. One of the men allegedly involved in her kidnapping was out on bail for murder. The list could probably go on and on. What is clear is that the most heinous crimes are not being committed by first-time offenders. They are being committed by career criminals who have committed violent crimes before and been released from prison. The obvious point that will be raised is the death penalty. If we just put these people to death, then they can't hurt anyone else anymore. Now, I'm one of those on the fence people about the death penalty. Yes, in terms of retribution, it's the ultimate punishment, and the human side of me would love to see some of these people get what they dished out. But it's not as simple as that. Whether you agree or disagree with the death penalty, the question here is, will it actually solve our problem? And personally, I don't think it will. The most fundamental issue with the death penalty question in South Africa is that we unfortunately cannot afford it. Many people believe that it must be cheaper to execute prisoners rather than keep them in prison for life. But that's not what the data shows. The United States is probably the biggest pool of data for the death penalty. And the information there shows that if you consider all of the additional appeals and extra services that death penalty inmates are entitled to, the cost of actually bringing an offender to the point of execution far outweighs the cost of keeping them in prison for life. To put a number to it, in the state of Pennsylvania, the cases of 185 people currently on death row there cost taxpayers $350 $350 million. That's just their initial cases and their appeals. That is without actually caring for them in prison. Granted, you can't directly compare the two systems or costs, but this is just a rough estimate to give us an idea. In South Africa, it currently costs 3 million rand to keep a prisoner in jail for 25 years. And if you look at the state of our prisons, the overcrowding, we cannot even afford to house the prisoners we have. And the irony is, we can't afford to put them to death either. You may argue that the death sentence could be the answer to overcrowding. Well, no, because you don't sentence someone to death and execute them immediately. The process takes at a minimum 10 years. And the reason for our overcrowding is not necessarily prisoners who would qualify for the death sentence anyway. 
Yes, we used to have the death penalty in South Africa, but we also weren't a democracy at that time, and we didn't have a constitution. Daisy DeMalco was executed within days of receiving her sentence. That would never happen today. So whether we're pro or anti-death penalty, the point is that it's just not an option for our country at this time. What is an option is imposing harsher sentences for violent criminals and having far stricter parole conditions in place. President Cyril Ramaphosa has said that this is something he will be addressing, and I certainly hope that is true. Unfortunately, While we address things, there are predators among us already and being released daily, hunting for the next victim. Thank you for listening to this week's mini-sode. If you enjoyed the content, please be sure to subscribe on the app that you're using to listen right now. Before I go, I'd like to introduce you to a true crime podcast called Stories After Dark, which also covers country-specific true crime cases, but from the Philippines. Jack the Ripper, the brutal serial killer who terrorized... execution of serial killer Ted Bundy. The new hunt for the Zodiac Killer. Island of the Dolls is definitely not... The Wendigo is insatiable. A sinister name, the Suicide Forest. You probably already know about America's Zodiac Killer, England's Jack the Ripper, Canada's Wendigo, and Japan's Suicide Forest. But how many of you know of true crime and mystery stories from the Philippines? My name is Derek, and I invite you to listen to Stories After Dark, a podcast where every other week I share such tales from my side of the world. From chop chop ladies and gruesome massacres, to haunted hotels and the swang. Listen and subscribe to Stories After Dark on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Also remember to follow us on our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a full episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.